Welcome back to the channels Tapa Alho Azul and Super Academico. Let us keep the reading of my book Phenomena. Today we will read the chapter 19. Don't forget to subscribe. Let's go. Chapter 19 At last, the day of the Amaranija came. After over four months since our arrival, we would finally testify the event in which the Aborigines say goodbye to the dead and deliver him to the spirits. One of the tribe's elderly had died the day before. Laura could not do much for him. He died from old age, a natural cause of death. In a way, we felt a little relieved by that, after all, we were waiting for someone to die. The old man was a member of the tribe's council and he had left behind a woman, also very old, and eight children. Three of them lived in Nierier, in the same community as Kanega. Sadness was moving through the entire tribe, although everyone knew he'd die at any time. They truly felt the loss of a tribe member a lot. We could only try to empathize with their consternation while we got ready to observe the event. They prepared some kind of an altar where the body would be laid upon. We spread spectral photo cameras as well as regular ones all over the place, keeping a minimum distance in order to avoid disturbing their event. They set aside the best firewood for the ceremonial's bonfire. Everything would happen in the middle of an area reserved for the Amaranija, which was located next to the village. We installed two seismographs in strategic places to verify any geologic activity. Both sides were getting ready for tonight's event. To them, it was a normal operation that every moment reminded them of loss and rebirth. To us it was the chance to observe a unique thing in the world. We had different viewpoints on the same subject. They didn't quite understand our point of view, but helped us. When the incident with the anthropologist happened, they didn't know that meant so much to us. They were surprised at the man's surprise when he saw the phenomenon. Even with all the expectations of the day, there were no questioning or clarifying of doubts. Our group's anxiety was evident in each step we took, in spite of all of our efficiency to get this job done. We were right before the two sides of the same search. A whole life of work and dedication. We were getting ready to see life. John opened our last meeting. At last, we will reach the end of our arduous mission tonight. We got sunshine, dry land, wild animals and lots of work, I didn't want to hear a speech on our time there. I was aware of what had happened. John, there is nothing to say. We got ready, studied, and we'll go through the end. I'd only ask one thing of everyone, keep an eye on each other. I know that everybody here is very professional, but what we are about to see can come as a great shock for some of us here, as it was for the anthropologist. Our mission lies in the very end and of this event and, I am sure, everybody wants everything to work out, right? I glanced at John and he said, Is everything okay then? Just one more thing, do they always keep the proper distance? I don't want to see any spirit be scared away, as usual, John gave a touch of good humor to the end of the meeting. I felt anxious, like everybody else, but my concerns had vanished with time. In all those months we were together, discovering our defects, qualities, manias, talents and longings, we became very close to each other. Maybe the fact that everyone was far away from home made us find our homes in the company of one another. The Aborigines were habitually like that while we were beginning to learn. Living close to them also gave us that. I trusted the group. I would lead them. That would happen in the moment of the phenomenon. We were all driven and firm. It was about time we reached our ultimate level of conscience. Everything was ready in the evening. We paired up about the place. Carla was with me, in order to compare visions and lead the others. The corpse was lying upon the altar all wrapped up with simple ornaments. Memories of his life. The bonfire was lit up when the night fell in. The fire which should last until the break of day. The sky was clear, like always, full of stars and with a nice moonlight. The wife of the deceased and five children of theirs were standing by the dead body, while the members of the tribe would get closer and gather around the family. The ceremony would begin shortly. Joseph, what are you thinking about? I'm not sure, Carla. A bunch of things are going through my head right now, my life, my future, how the others will react to my report. Why? What are you thinking about? She looked very serious. Mom and Dad. I looked at her. Then I saw the thirteen-year-old orphan girl again. I thought a little of Donnie, but I didn't know exactly what to say to her. I'd already overcome that kind of problem a long time ago. I petted her in the shoulder and said, Calm down. Everything is going to be all right. 
I try to talk with a fatherly tone as an attempt to hide my seriousness and lack of touch. I wondered what the others would be thinking of that. They started to sing. It was a soothing and relaxing music like Kanega had already described. They began to dance around the corpse. The wife and children would only sing while the others danced. Nothing besides that happened for a while, then the wind started to blow, yet it was not a strong wind that had come from the desert and get everything covered with dust. It was just a suave and cold breeze. I noticed that they changed their dancing moves. I waved at John as to indicate that everybody had to pay attention. Then, clouds would slowly start to get formed up in the sky, as if moving to the sound of their music. The seismograph that was standing by my side began to display something. I didn't quite know how to read that, but something was definitely happening. Then Carla said. Joseph, look at the corpse. I looked at it and saw that it was lightened up. It wasn't only reflecting the fire, it seemed to generate its own light. I signaled to John and told him to begin taking photographs. The dancing rhythm changed again and soon the sky was all cloudy. Carla looked fixedly at the dead body as it continued lightened up. A thunder roared in the sky. I looked upward and couldn't help fearing that entire situation. When I looked back down to the dance floor, there they were, tents of spirits dancing nearby each other. They were all aborigines. Their images were normal, but I knew what they were. I turned to Carla. Do you see a second circle within the original one? She glanced at the dance. She was paying attention to the body and didn't notice it. And then she said, I see a different brightness around them. It seems like fire, but comes from within. That's it. It's them. Keep looking at the body. She realized my satisfaction. At that very moment, I was sharing my vision with somebody. Everybody kept dancing. Lightning cut through the sky followed by furious thunders. I'd look at John and he'd signal that everything was okay. I don't know what he saw but I was amazed. It was cheerful live. Both the dead and the living from the same tribe celebrating together. The corpse's brightness increased. Carla saw that and cried about so much emotion. He was arising as that woman had said. That white light was going to up to meet with his ancestors and they were there to welcome him. It was a sublime moment of deep peacefulness and happiness. They kept dancing and chanting for a while, before the spirits began to vanish and the sky returned to normality again. I felt exhausted, happy, but exhausted. All that had drained almost all my energy. I had been consumed by the contact and excitement of that event. I don't know about the others, but I went to sleep right there and then. I was dead tired. I woke up the following day with Carla standing right in front of me. She and all the others were gathered all around me inside our hut. Good morning, Joseph. Did you sleep well? I was still a little sleepy. I couldn't remember very well what had happened the night before. I think so. How did I end up here? We carried you. What do you remember? John asked me while Carla placed my head onto her lap. Me? I remember. I remember the light arising up into the sky, Carla smiles for me and for the others afterwards. I never thought that, out of the whole group, you'd be the one who'd pass out, everybody laughed out of a certain feeling of relief. I didn't faint. I fell asleep. It was like reaching ecstasy. I felt so comfortable before all that and fell in deep sleep. John gets down and pets me on my shoulder. That's all right, Joseph. You're back now. Certainty, you were who saw the most and that could only affected you greatly. I didn't quite understand his tone. And what about you? He stood up. Most of us seemed to have seen only the shininess around the corpse. Carla saw a little more. Don't worry, we have everything recorded after we develop the films and write our reports. I meant how you feel, John. Oh, I think I'm fine. The psychological evaluation will be conducted in Melbourne. I looked at those faces and thought they seemed normal. There was no more tension like before, but I think the phenomenon had not affected them as it did me. I looked at Carla and asked. And what about you, Carla, how do you feel? Her face was the only one that looked different. I am well. I think I've never felt any better before, that was the second phenomenon in her life. I would say that a cycle got closed for Carla. Revisiting the transposition into the spiritual realm allowed her to finally to leave her 13-year-old child who saw her parents go away in the past. I was happy for her. Relax, Joseph. We will pack our stuff and leave tomorrow morning. There will be a farewell party tonight. 
I suggest that you get started on your report so that you can stay in Melbourne. The folks back in your country will probably want you to come back soon with your main report all written up. That was true and Carla also knew that. She didn't say anything but left with the others looking serious. She knew that we would not remain together but I think she'd be able to take care of herself from that point on. I remained lying down for a few more minutes. Some things seemed extremely clear to me but others became completely obscure. In a certain way, I felt renewed and distant. My mission there had been accomplished. I needed to move on. Despite the momentum, the farewell dinner was cheerful. We had met some people there who would remain our friends forever. Even if we never saw those men and women who led such simple life again, we knew that they would always remember us and as we would them. We did not talk a lot. It was just a little get-together that music and dance. It was time to say goodbye. We left in the following morning. I looked back and saw a bunch of people waving goodbye. I felt well, I believe they did too. We were carrying more than information for our research. We were taking a piece of their souls with us, especially me. I felt as if I'd changed again. We got away from the village. I saw that landscape around us. It greener now with the overflowing of the river. I felt like Kanega did on the first day we got there. There is not anything better to appreciate than our home. I started thinking about home, dad, mom, and Anne. I also thought of my nephew, who'd have already been born at that point. I saw the aborigines waving goodbye and thought of Donnie. The times of our lives would all fit in like a jigsaw. They wouldn't all spread all over the place. All those pieces together gave shape to an image, which I just didn't know exactly what it would be. We found our way back to Melbourne. We stopped in Nierriere and said goodbye to John's family and then caught the silver doom back to Augusta. Thank God it held firm throughout the whole trip. On my way to Melbourne, I wrote the report I'd turn in at the university. I hoped it helped the other group members. We caught the flight Melbourne in Augusta. Carla didn't seem disturbed for being in that city anymore. She had really matured. She avoided talking to me during the trip. She knew we'd say goodbye to each other very soon. And so did I. I think it was better like that. Yet, I'd still look at her with a certain grief. I knew I'd been good for her and that she'd been also good for me, but the physical distance and the fact that our worlds were so far away from each other didn't leave us a lot of choice. I have good memories of Carla Franren. Perhaps if we had somehow sacrificed in order to stay together, we would find out, in its due time, that was not what we really wanted. At least, good memories don't provoke feelings of regret. I think she felt the same. We landed in Melbourne and we were welcomed by Professor Mandison. His nervous look seemed to have be intensified upon our arrival. He was anxious to see our results. We went back to the University of Melbourne. I didn't have a lot of time because Harvard had made reservations for me to return to the United States in two days. I had to go through the psychological evaluation and to finish writing my report before leaving for the US. Fortunately, I managed to get everything done in good timing. I had barely flown into Melbourne and could already smell another farewell right around the corner. I had to fly into Sydney and then finally head for Boston. Our group, always so close, felt a little lost when returned to a civilization. And I'd leave them soon. I passed the psychological evaluation. I didn't get to see the others do it, but I am sure they all passed it. They were ready and firm. The poor anthropologist was not prepared for such revelation. I made copies of my report, gave one to Professor Mandison and one to each team member. I wanted everyone to be aware of all the aspects of the phenomena. I packed my suitcases at night when everybody came into my room. It was an honor to have you with us, Joseph. I hope you'll honor us again someday. Professor Mandison still treated me as a celebrity. John didn't say anything. He seemed very sad. He only hugged me. The others made gentle farewell statements that don't need to be mentioned herein and Carla finally came up to me. What else is there to say? She learned with me to be ironic when in difficult times. I normally wait to see what the other person will say. As for me? I'm never going to forget you, Joseph. No matter what happens henceforth. She looked at me and hugged me. She meant that. Then she left the room. After she left that room, I only saw Carla Franren once again, when she came to New York back in 1983. She gave a lecture on parapsychology and me I didn't pass on that opportunity to see her once more. I also met her husband and two children. I never forgot either. In the following morning we were all together again, close by the car that would take me to the airport. 
They took some snapshots and gave some to me as souvenirs. I looked at all those faces and felt the affection and the mutual interest that bound us. From within of the car, moving away again, I once more felt the pain and happiness of saying goodbye. After all, I was getting away from people I liked knowing they liked me too. The ambiguity of the moment got me thinking of aborigines we left behind once again. In everything that we went through together, in us. It also made me think about Donnie, Ols Park, and home. I was going back there. And, this time around, besides the learning experience, the new study material, and without a doubt, enough information for a new book, I also acquired a greater self-knowledge, the sort of learning I'd take with me for the rest of my life, maybe all the lives I had yet to live. The airplane took off from Sydney. I saw the last images of Australia. I compared it, in my mind, with Melbourne, which was so regular. The Northern Territory, so rural. And Sydney, so modern. The ocean ended up being the only image I could see from that point on. The beautiful country that was so hospitable with me was be left behind now? Only memories remained in my mind. I felt at peace and wanted some more. All that led me to an unknown place. I wanted to go through the end of it. I wanted to see it. My experience in Australia was unforgettable. That seemed to make some sense after all. Sometimes I regret never having returned there. Perhaps I'll still do it someday. After a while, the letters stopped coming until they stopped coming for good. I heard from them every once in a while. Like the airplane was flying away from the great island, time got those people that taught me so much so far away from me. I never allowed my memory to delete them. I'm fallen asleep. I hope you have enjoyed this reading. Don't forget to subscribe to both channels and like and share the video. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.